This video has been supported by PCBWay. Hey folks, we've touched this topic before in a previous video. Back then I was underinformed and eager to flap my lips about some other oddly specific triviality. Today I'm still woefully underinformed and I'd much rather talk to you about vacuum cleaners. But alas, the vaults need nothing and the PPMs demand their isolation. So let me share with you some observations about low frequency common mode currents in power transformers. Oh, doesn't that sound exciting? No? Well, let me rephrase that. Breaking news, 95% of engineers shocked by this one simple trick that the transformer industry doesn't want you to know about. Um, no, I'm serious. Ordinary transformers are no good when dealing with sensitive floating circuits. Let's look at the universally respected toroidal transformer, for example. Its primary and secondary windings are directly on top of each other all the way around, with only a sub-millimeter film layer in between, giving them the absolute maximum interwinding capacitance. That lets a little bit of AC cross the isolation barrier without having been magnetic flux before. Without that origin it's lacking a sense of direction and it'll just infect the whole transformer secondary side as if it was a capacitor plate. It'll be eager to leave though, no matter through which wire. <laughs> One could almost call it common. If we, for example, block its escape route to Earth out of either of the two wires with a 10 meg voltmeter input impedance, we can see what a huge effect this can become if not treated. Over 60 volt corresponds to 6 microampere flowing from what should be an isolated secondary site into protective Earth. Unacceptable. A common, common mode filter in a practical size doesn't help at all. Neither before nor after the transformer nor above or below it. These are simply made for higher frequency content. Normally in consumer hardware that doesn't matter much because the transformer's secondary side tends to be grounded. But in electronic test and measurement equipment it is desirable to be able to choose if, how and which signal to ground. And that can lead to strange intransparent conditions where suddenly the mains wiring in your walls, chassis capacitances or a voltage drop over your test leads can impact your measurements. We don't have to untangle any of these unpleasantries because the goal and the motivation are pretty easy to phrase. I just want something that behaves more like an ideal theoretical transformer with minimal leakage so that I can use it without thinking back and forth about grounding and guarding and whatnot. So why don't we just go ahead and compare a few existing off-the-shelf solutions before we attempt building our own. This is Fluke 732A, the star of a previous episode, which you should definitely check out if you haven't seen it before. And this is a 10k resistor with which I'm going to connect the isolated, more or less floating output low to chassis ground which is internally connected to protective earth. Obviously I haven't taken apart the transformer in here but I'm pretty sure it just uses a normal laminated EI core. With windings on split bobbins and a copper electrostatic shield between the two. An electrical connection to that shield is brought out to the front panel via the guard terminal so that the operator can choose what to do with it. Initially I choose to do exactly nothing with it. This way the common mode effects that do make it into the isolated circuitry have nowhere else to go but through the 10k resistor. In this configuration a measurement with a mains powered oscilloscope shows us around 0.7 microampere RMS. Not bad, that's an order of magnitude better than the toroidal transformer before, but the signal is so ugly and spiky, with a large peak to peak value. I suspect that's a contribution from the oscilloscope and its switching power supply. Let's use the guard terminal and give the common mode currents somewhere to go where they don't distort our measurements. Ah, much better. We are down to around 500 nanoampere RMS. And since the Fluke is a reputable, established device, I think this number is a good one to aim for in DIY approaches. I'm going to be content if I can reach something similar or better. How about Keysite 3458A next? I specifically got a cheap battery powered scope for this purpose now. No more switching power supply contribution in our results. And for simplicity's sake I'm just going to use the front end's 1 mega ohm input impedance as the current measuring shunt. Oh my, it's almost another order of magnitude better. 67 nanoampere RMS from the new black one. Full length video about that coming out soon. And a very similar figure for the old HP unit. Whether or not guard was connected to low didn't make a huge difference here. Whoa, whoa, I think we have to slow down lest we reveal all the best performers right at the start. 
Let's see if an especially gnarly cheap switcher can outleak the toroidal transformer. This whole thing weighs about as much as the USB screw terminal thingy. Wait, what? Oh, maybe I should plug in the outlets, that might help. Oh yeah, that's more like it. Oh, almost 10 microampere from this thing, that's pretty bad. How about a brand name switcher? Wow, the well-meaning Meanwell is pretty good for a switcher. 750 nanoampere RMS. Switching converters such as these are quite complicated, but I think the main contributor to these unwanted currents is the very same one that plagues us in linear transformers as well. The interwinding capacitance is of course much worse with the ultra-low-cost, ultra-miniature transformer that the 5 volt power brick uses. Oh, would you look at this little guy, isn't it cute? As opposed to the reasonably dimensioned part in the Meanwell PSU. Following this, I would postulate that DC to DC converters with the highest available with standing isolation voltages could also very well be good common mode performers. Hmm, does anybody remember what kind of parts we had to use while building CERN's digitizer? Oh look, it's a medical grade AC to DC switcher. You know, one that needs high voltage isolation. Consider me surprised. Oops, no, that's actually terrible performance from the Traco power part. But HPM7177 manages to save it with that circular input connector grounding board, I suspect. With its help, it's about as good as Fluke732A with half a microampere RMS. But I still like my theory. Higher voltage parts need larger gaps. Larger gaps mean lower capacitances, and that in turn means more AC attenuation. Okay, three more candidates before we get to the special delicacies. This is a random laminated EI core, but not with split bobbins. The windings are smooshed right up against each other again, giving them good coupling, but not particularly extreme isolation. It's also a physically large chonker, capable of delivering 100 watts or two. And sure enough, it's not great for our purposes today. But the situation can possibly be salvaged, just like this transformer has been once. The core can be grounded, taking it out of the capacitive coupling equation mostly. The remaining interwinding leakage can be shunted to earth with a capacitor, which lowers it drastically. This is only a countermeasure for very bad situations. If you've got a cleaner transformer, this can backfire and make things worse. Hiding in plain sight, and probably almost every electronics parts box around the world, the humble potted PCB transformer. This is worth single digit monies and for that it's arguably good. But in the grand scheme of things not really noteworthy. Before seeing the Keysight 3458A result, I was completely convinced that this baby would win, at least the first segment of this video. It has the craziest shielded, guarded, mu metal armored million tap transformer in there. But damn, that's going to be close. I'm going to sort this list at the very end, the race is not yet over. Now we are going to look at a few things that I specifically bought or built for common mode research. How about a QI charger? Now I know such newfangled tech is automatically going to be frowned upon by the greybeards. Rightfully so, the normal mode noise coming out of the receiver is going to be terrible. But normal mode noise is something we can get under control with just RC filtering or a low noise regulator. My next voltage standard will require about a watt of power. So if we can transfer a little more than that for conversion and denoisification inefficiencies over some distance, and thereby get rid of the common mode noise, that would be worth exploring. And yeah, we can clearly attenuate the leakage with distance, but unfortunately, at least with these cheap eBay modules, at a distance where the leakage becomes good, the transferred power isn't even enough anymore to supply the status LED, let alone keep an LTZ1000 at temperature. With a better send coil on some old TI dev board, it's just downright incompatible. So I'm going to have to tug this one away as interesting with better hardware maybe, but not really viable for me right now. This is a small split bobbin power transformer that is currently available on DigiKey, and inexpensively so. It's got low capacitive coupling mentioned quite prominently in its datasheet. Promising. With the windings being separated so nicely, the core capacitance is a much bigger deal of course. So grounding that is highly effective. And that finally gives us a great unproblematic low leakage transformer. Cheap, available and better than Fluke732A. Ah, another video finished. Cheers. 
I mean, unless you guys want to continue this quest and find out how low we can go. Yeah, I guess that'd be the vault nutty thing to do. How about we mutilate two of these great performers, gouge out their secondary windings, and couple the cores with a single turn each? That gives us a bit of an inconvenient output voltage, but common mode leakages in the same league as 3458A. Unfortunately, AL, the inductance per turn of a laminated steel core, is not that great. That's why the output voltage sags massively under the slightest load. I don't think we could even get a watt out of this pair. But this experiment sends us in the right direction, I think. We want fewer turns. I actually have two Keithleys here which utilize such a double transformer strategy. For the model 182 sensitive voltmeter, which also needs to be covered in a video someday, it is of the utmost importance to keep common mode current to a minimum. Because it has a 1 nanovolt resolution, and that would be entirely worthless if we were to allow a single microampere to flow through an optimistic 10 milliohm test lead. That would already generate 10 nanovolt, possibly overshadowing all the measurement results. So it only makes sense that this one is the lowest leaker we've found so far, with 10 nanoampere RMS. Not quite sure what's going on here, maybe my earth lead is going somewhere it shouldn't, but I repeated the Keithley 617 measurement later again and confirmed that it is not much worse than the 812. On the internet, especially in hi-fi communities, there have been rumors about a certain type of medical isolation transformer. The brands Topaz and Zentec are said to have used forbidden arcane knowledge to craft the ultimate weapon against common mode. Extreme isolation transformers with single-digit femtofarad interwinding capacitances, or so they claim at least. Funny coincidence, I just so happen to have one right here. Regrettably, it's not very good. I mean, it's a high-quality medical isolation transformer, but it's not special in terms of leakage. 88 volt over a 10 mega ohm voltmeter impedance means 8.8 .8 microampere RMS. It's a bit worse than the toroidal transformer while being much larger, so I guess it's something. But it's not physics defying and it's certainly not just a femtofarad. I am determined though to at least get some value out of this purchase, so I'll take it apart real quick. And you have to watch. <laughs> Just look at the all-metal construction. Even if they managed to limit their capacitance to a femtofarad internally, the inter-cable capacitance would be greater. Yeah, they have a nice crunchy shield between primary and secondary. And I guess that really gives them quite a low direct interwinding capacitance. Simply ignoring away the core capacitances sounds like just the thing marketing would do. So far, all of our candidates, the best and the worst, had one thing in common. They were converting electric energy into a magnetic flux and that back into electric energy with various metal parts. Now what if we used different energy conversions that don't require such close proximity of metal parts? Opening that door leads to all sorts of silly ideas, like how about we boil a kettle of water and power our voltage standard with a steam turbine? Or we could go to some former Soviet country and try to yoink an abandoned radio thermoelectric generator. But voltage standards tend to be a bit sensitive to thermal stuff, so that wouldn't be my first choice. We could harness the ancient mysterious powers of the universe and build a tidal power plant. But running a cable from the coast to my lab would be a bit inconvenient. A detour over mechanical energy, like a motor connected to a generator, might work. But that usually comes with wear and noise, so I'd prefer a solid-state system. This is a concentrator solar cell. A fingernail-sized semiconductor that you can funnel into, sunlight from up to 1000 times its area. This tiny chip from German company Azure Space can supposedly collect up to 40 watt if you cool it enough. That's not only something I would like to cover my roof in, but it's also just about compact enough to become a DC to DC converter. 3 watt LED power goes in, solar cell and LED inefficiencies are subtracted, and boom, we get the most beautifully isolated leftover whatever. That was the plan at least. Unfortunately, it's also a triple junction solar cell based on different semiconductor materials with sensitivity to various wavelengths. That gives these modules record breaking efficiency when collecting real broadband sunlight. But the monotonic output from a cheap power LED just doesn't satisfy. In fact, putting an infrared LED on the collector to target the band of peak efficiency makes the output drop to near zero. That's because if one of the junctions feels left out, it doesn't want to conduct anymore. So I guess we'd have to go with some organically grown high CRI solution. But even then it's tricky. 
Optical coupling tricky, maximum power point tracking tricky, heat generation undesirable, and so forth. But for solar power, certainly interesting. I have kind of introduced the irrefutable universal cure very early in this video. It is of course battery power, because with galvanic isolation and no AC to jump over isolation barriers, common mode currents do not exist. These days it's easier than ever to get battery power to any old piece of test gear, thanks to these power stations rising in popularity and falling in cost. This little guy for example can power an entire Cal lab in your car trunk for hours, so that you can take your PPMs with you on holiday. Careful though, using an inverter like this sends you right back into common mode country, only direct DC battery power counts. I could make another quick video about this power station if anybody's interested, it's pretty cool. Fluke actually uses a very interesting hybrid battery power implementation in their super thermometers. Supposedly they have two ADCs and two large capacitors in there. They charge the capacitors and perform ADC conversions in an anti-cyclic manner. Meaning that only one capacitor at a time is connected to the grid to recharge, while the other one and its associated ADC can be isolated while performing a conversion. Sounds appropriate for a world class resistance bridge like that. And sure, my voltage standard gets battery power too, but no anti-cyclic switching, that is too complicated for this project. In EEV block episode 731 we get a brief glimpse at an interesting transformer inside of a Keithley DMM7510. Except for their patent applications, little was known about this for the longest time. The idea is to use coaxial or even triaxial cable to wind transformers. The inner conductor being a normal winding and the shields being shields. As long as both ends of a shield are not shorted out, that's actually allowed, go figure. Because the inner conductors are surrounded mostly by their shield, there is little direct coupling between primary and secondary. And the most charming thing of all, if you just leave the shields floating that makes them especially effective. Because the voltages that are impressed on them by their respective windings are in phase. For example if primary is driven high, then secondary follows suit without delay, because of their magnetic interaction. That way the voltages on the shields too are always pushed in the same direction at the same time. So the voltage across them never changes and no current flows. The grand finale of our transformer battle is approaching and for that we really are returning to somewhat normal transformers. Because as far as I can tell the world record has been achieved with one and everything else is just too finicky. This is a paper by Metron Designs, a descendant of Wavetech. Outlining some details for a 200 picoampere peak to peak leakage DC to DC converter. This is a patented commercial product so obviously they are not too eager to give away the complete recipe. But thanks to EEV block forum members we do have some more hints and teardown photos of a related implementation in a Wavetech 7000 DC voltage standard. Based on all of this I made an attempt at replicating these great results. Felt good, like getting confirmations for all the little details we've worked out throughout this video. The Wavetech Metron design seems to be a two-stage transformer with two small cores coupled by an intermediate wire. Each core along with its associated primary and secondary winding is completely encased by a conductive plastic shell. It can't be too conductive or else it'll act like a shorted turn saturating the first core. No details are known, I just went with a standard conductive filament from Protopasta. We don't know how many turns the cores are getting but the paper mentions amorphous metal. That's a mind blowing high tech material that is created by cooling down a molten metal alloy so quickly that its crystalline structure has no time to become metal. Its properties are more glass like, but what practically matters to us is that amorphous transformer cores have the highest inductance factors in the industry. So we can probably get away with few windings which is great. The paper also mentions a push-pull architecture and slew rate limiting. Two features that are conveniently available in an IC called LT3439. And that isn't even back ordered for all eternity. So I quickly whipped up a circuit board based on that part, pasted an LTZ1000 circuit next to it and sent it off to be lovingly manufactured by our sponsor PCBWay. They've been a great partner and helped make this project a reality with a record breaking turnaround time. My design files were checked for manufacturability and approved within 10 minutes after uploading them. The actual production process and the delivery were lightning quick as well, truly a refreshing experience nowadays. 
PCBWay is now hosting a community projects hub, where you can not only learn about other interesting engineering endeavors that they have supported, but also browse popular open hardware projects or share your own, and get a small commission whenever somebody orders your boards. Of course my next 10 volt standard will also be here, the link will be in the video description. Meanwhile the delivery has arrived. As a side dish I've added a hastily designed first generation battery module to this order. No idea if that'll work the way I imagine or if it'll blow up right away. So no gold plating or anything on this one. The main board however has seen quite a few iterations and I'm beginning to feel confident about it. Today though I only want to focus on the right half where our quest for truly extreme isolation is going to find its conclusion. Hope you don't mind if I use an older version to demo the Metron Wavetech inspired transformer on. This version is not yet pretty, it was a playground, but it's equipped with the LT3439 already. Now we have constructed a DC to DC converter, but we can't really assign an objective number to quantify its common mode leakage. Because what this does is attenuate the common mode leakage of the mains power supply before it. So we should probably give it an attenuation value in decibel, I think. That should come out to around minus 31 decibel if I have mathed that correctly. But don't trust me on this, as a DC person I hardly know what a decibel is. And at any rate there are plenty of possibilities for improvements still waiting to be explored. For comparability with the rest of the list I'm just going to add two results, one with a good and one with a bad mains power supply before it. It's also worth noting that this haphazardly constructed transformer can deliver over 5 watt without overheating the driver chip. With better construction probably even more than that. So bottom line, when being fed by anything better than the absolute worst leakers this is a great performer. When combined with one of the better mains power supplies on the list the result is easily number one. But there are a few things that I don't like about it, like the involvement of 3D printed parts, the difficult and fragile assembly, and the fact that it might still be copyrighted. So my final solution is different yet again. It is inspired in small parts by all of the best solutions we've tested today. And in a large part by a fellow Voltenat from Poland who's shown me these huge amorphous toroidal cores. They may seem outrageously large on the board, but in a way they do more for us even than the 30 kg medical isolation transformer could have. For the windings I'm using a foil shielded twisted pair. I don't need many because of the absolutely enormous AL value of these cores. For a 1 watt load, how about 2 maybe? Mechanically this approach is implemented in accordance with the KISS principle. I'm just going to cable tie the transformer to the board, that'll be all but indestructible I think. And here's how the end result is going to look. I'm still waiting for some proper copper binding posts for the front panel, but apart from that we are ready to go. Mm, it didn't quite behave the way I had hoped, because a few minor mistakes have slipped through the last revision. Nothing a bit of mild superficial rework couldn't fix. Now it gets the same treatment as the previous DC to DC converter. First a horrible mains power supply to estimate the attenuation. Hmm, it's also in the 30 decibel neighborhood. I wonder if the transformers are so good that my PCB clearances are becoming the limiting factor. I'll try to add more in the next revision that's for sure. But for now I'm getting 24 nano ampere RMS out of this super cheap and simple construction if it has a somewhat decent mains power supply before it. That is much better than I had hoped to achieve today, so I'll gladly submit that as my result to the list. Please leave a comment below if you have some interesting data points to add to this. You really only need a battery powered oscilloscope with a known input impedance to measure these values. But honestly I'm not sure how long my enthusiasm for this niche and therefore my resolve to maintain this list is going to survive. Alright time for the moment of truth, time to sort things out. Oh yeah, our solution is on place 5 or 6 depending on which value we sort by. We are less leaky than Keysight 3458A and there are still plenty of opportunities for improvement left unexplored. But I think I'll leave that to somebody else, the left side of my voltage standard needs attention now. It may come as a surprise to you but this board isn't only a weak lossy DC to DC converter. It also regulates 12 volt down to 10, isn't that amazing? I think so too, and if we aren't nuking ourselves into oblivion until then, I'll be sure to record another 20 minute monologue about it. 
That's it for today though. Thank you for watching.